and uh, I, uh, I guess I'll introduce myself <laughs> since I'm kind of the uh, moderator today. I did want to mention one thing that um, indeed uh, the Sheets legacy um, lives on and it, and it was located here in Claremont. Um, you will all get a, a little map of uh, Claremont modern architecture um, today. Um, just up the street is the uh, Pomona First Federal Bank that, that Miller did. And um, he uh, worked with uh, many local artists. His studio was just down, down the street on, on Foothill Boulevard here. And uh, it was something that we're incorporating art into the architecture and creating an experience. I think, in, and we've got uh, his daughter Carolyn here, and also Brian Worley, who worked uh, at the studio. Just raise your hand, Brian. I mean, if when you when you guys uh, take a break for lunch, or whatever, feel free to ask some questions because uh, these two know a lot about it. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the residential side of things, but um, I will introduce myself. So, I'm David Shearer. I'm the executive director of Claremont Heritage. And uh, if I just, I can just read you my bio. Um, <laughs> uh, I've been influential in disseminating design and design education to the public for over three decades. I studied uh, architecture at the University of Minnesota under Ralph Rapson, the uh, modernist architect. I moved to uh, New York City in uh, 19... 90 and founded a uh, design gallery called Totem, which stood for the objects that evoke meaning. And it was based on a conversation that I had with Ray Eames, where she talked about the, um, her, some jewelry that she had that she'd gotten in India. And she said, this, this object holds a memory of that time and place. And it's like a totem. And I, that stuck in my mind. Um, I later ran a nonprofit organization called Exhibitions International that produced and traveled exhibitions about architecture and design to museums around the world. Um, I've curated or produced over 100 exhibitions and programs. Wow, I didn't realize that. Um, <laughs> including, uh, I did, uh, I helped uh, produce the Dwell on Design Palm Springs. I think the only time Dwell on Design has been in Palm Springs, 2008. I did a show called Mobile Living in New York City in 2006. Techno Organic, 2010, I've uh, done some publications and documentaries. I actually was one of the producers on uh, Desert Utopia, which is the quintessential uh, Palm Springs uh, documentary. And um, in uh, 2009, I moved, I actually went to high school in Glendora, not too far from here. So my family's all here. I moved back to uh, the Claremont area in 2009 and opened a gallery called Object here in Claremont. Like I said, I'm currently the executive director of Claremont Heritage, and uh, I'm a programming consultant to uh, Architecture and Design Museum in Los Angeles, and uh, I'm uh, also very active in preservation on both coasts. So, it's, it is not open anymore. Unfortunately, the market um, just really wasn't quite, you know, good enough. But actually, that's how I, I got to know Claremont Heritage, because I did a, a show called Claremont Modernism, which showed um, architecture and art and also furniture, Sam Maloof and things like that. It was almost a, kind of a precursor to the Huntington show, the house that Sam built. Um, oh, hi, Beverly. Oh, yeah. I recognize you. So um, you probably remember that show. I don't know. Uh, we borrowed a lot of things from, from the foundation for that show. Um, so I've been uh, really promoting uh, Claremont modern design and the history of it and documenting it. A few years ago, we had a symposium here um, called Claremont Modern. We had Alan Hess. We had Barbara Lamprecht. And we had Hicks Stone, the son of uh, Edward Durrell Stone, come and speak. And I'm just going to read you the foreword to a little catalog that we did, which is available at the desk over there if you want to pick up a copy. But this kind of just tells the story of Claremont. 
Known as the City of Trees and PhDs, Claremont, in, <laughs> yes, we are known as the City of Trees and PhDs. Um, we've got seven institutions of higher learning, and we've got a lot of trees, although some of them haven't survived the drought. But uh, it embodies an almost utopian environment that is a wonderful mix of small town atmosphere combined with robust academic and cultural attributes. Claremont Modern documents the intersection of art and architecture in a community that produced an incredible output during the mid 20th century. In fact, Claremont could very well be one of the best hidden secrets in the annals of modernism. So um, I'm just gonna name some of the, the architects who worked here. Um, and it was very much linked to the artists. So architecture was not very far behind the, the art here. Herman Garner, who built this house and also built the Padua Theater up in, in Padua, the hills up here, um, created an artist colony up in, up in the Padua Hills. And you can drive up there. They're, they're, the map has, has directions. Um, you can drive up there and see houses designed by a number of influential architects for artists, mainly. Um, Mr. Garner created a... Um, uh, an art uh, jury that had to approve the designs for the houses. Millard Sheets was on that jury. A guy named Foster Rhodes Jackson was on that jury. And then there was a, uh, a landscape architect actually from a uh, nearby city. So some of the uh, architects that worked up there were uh, Fred McDowell, who um, designed a, uh, a house for Harrison McIntosh, the ceramicist. Um, Betty Davenport Ford was another artist who, who lived up there, and she actually, her and her husband designed her house. Arthur and Jean Ames uh, lived up there, um, and they actually did, if you go visit the Garrison Theater here at the Scripps College campus, you'll see some tapestries that were also woven in France, the same, same mill uh, that they designed, and they, they lived here up in the Padua Hills. Millard actually built his own home up there, we'll see that in a, in a, in a few minutes. Um, Foster Rhodes Jackson designed several masterpieces up in the foothills. Uh, painter Carl Benjamin commissioned a house from Fred McDowell down here in the, in on 8th Street. Um, Buff and Hensman built here. Cliff May did a number of uh, uh, things. Uh, mainly the, he, there's, there is one early uh, 30s kind of more Hacienda style, but there are uh, quite a few of the, uh, the prefab that he and uh, Chris Choate designed. So, and, and as we've seen, uh, modern architecture was not limited to just the residential projects. So um, during this period, there was a much output. We've seen a lot about Millard Sheets, but um, we'll also, there's some, some things on the wall that you can, can take a look at too. Um, Edward Durrell Stone designed two of the college campuses, uh, the School of Theology and Harvey Mudd. He also did work some work with Millard Sheets on a project up in Sacramento, which was never built, but it was a pedestrian mall. And um, it was interesting because when we asked uh, Hicks Stone, well, you know, you, your, your dad and Millard Sheets kind of had the, you know, they, they were both kind of pioneers of the new formalism uh, architectural style. And did they work together? And he's like, I don't think so. But then we found in the archives this project that was never built that they had worked together. It was really quite interesting. So uh, John Lautner actually designed an office building and a shopping center here that were never built, unfortunately. He did build, uh, design the Henry's Diner, which was just across the border in Pomona on Foothill Boulevard, which uh, unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, and um, I'm sure some of the speakers this afternoon are going to speak to some of those those things too. That we've got the master here, Alan Hess. Uh, so, but I'm just going to run through um, some of the residential architecture, kind of starting with it was a, a home tour we did last year that was looking at um, kind of the precursor to modernism in Claremont, and it was like 1900 to uh, let me just it was called Mission to Modern. And it was uh, looking at kind of the progression of, of modernism uh, in Claremont. And of course, bottom one, okay. 
uh, we can go back to the only green and green home in Claremont, the Darling Residence. Uh, in, a, in an archival photo on the left and what it looks like today. Um, it is just down the street here um, on 8th Street. You could, you could walk to it. It's a couple blocks away. And it's a, it's a beautiful structure. So Green and Green really did, you know, they were thinking in kind of a modernist aesthetic and idiom. And so we kind of felt like, well, maybe they, they brought a little bit of that to, to Claremont. The Sarah Bixby Smith House, which was called Erewhon, uh, and no longer with us, was um, a little bit more of a kind of a chalet style. But the interesting story here is that uh, she was, uh, Sarah Bixby Smith was cousins with uh, Edward Weston. And so he visited Claremont uh, on a number of times and actually photographed her kids, her two boys, um, in the swimming pool of this home, which the photograph is there in 1919. And, um, and also the Schindlers were quite good friends with the Westons, and they also visited Claremont. So there was some interesting things happening. Uh, the Baker House is a good example of the Spanish colonial style, which is also, you know, kind of, a, I think that that's a, um, has some elements and a precursor to some of the modernist uh, designs that we see coming later. Milford Zorns, uh, the famous painter, uh, had a house built um, 1938 um, by architect Carl Trodson. And I'm just gonna just read you a little bit about, uh, about this house and about uh, Carl. Um, well, David Gebert and uh, Robert Winter described this house as a sophisticated international style essay in brick and glass. In the uh, 1938, uh, architectural Guide to Los Angeles. So the house was built on a property given as a wedding present to the artist Milford Zorns and his bride. Zorns, who had studied and later taught at Pomona College, lived in this house when, when he designed the beautiful mural for the Claremont Post Office, which is still there. And he went on to become one of the most prominent members of the California Watercolor School. Um, Carl Trotson was a Swedish architect he was a student at Claremont Graduate School when he designed this home, later taught at USC before returning to Sweden as a professor of architecture. He did return to Los Angeles after World War II to continue a distinguished archite architectural career, and this home was featured in the 1941 edition of Architectural Record uh, as $6,000 worth of sunshine. That was the title of the article. And it was also in the May 1944 issue of American Home Magazine. So this was a very interesting, we had this on our home tour last year, and it's a, it's a great, a great home. The Millard Sheets uh, home up in the Padua Hills, 1943, uh, unfortunately uh, burned in one of the fires that came through the foothills a number of years ago. It has been uh, rebuilt by the uh, current owners um, using the same footprint and uh, some of the, the same plans. They're, they did change things a little bit, but um, one of the things that was interesting about this house was that it was rammed earth, and it was a very early um, uh, example of rammed earth. It actually appears in Anthony Merrill's 1947 book, The Rammed Earth House, and rammed earth was a low-cost post-World War II housing uh, style that was um, developed and uh, Miller decided to try to use it. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the local city uh, planners and uh, uh, permit uh, people weren't too familiar with rammed earth, so they made uh, Miller uh, spray it with gunite like you would a swimming pool. and. Uh, it uh, probably didn't need that, but um, but they were just they were concerned it was going to eighteen inches thick the walls. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. And actually, the uh, the current owners have preserved a, a a part, a couple of parts of the original rammed earth 
house that, that remained after the fire, and they've included them inside the walls with little viewing windows and things that you can so you can kind of see the what it, what it, what it was like before. Um, okay. This is an interesting project. This was the Intercultural Council Housing Project, which was one of the first, um, maybe the first uh, kind of co-op uh, housing projects in California. And it was interesting because it was intercultural. There were 12 houses built, um, and uh, half of the houses went to Mexican-American families and half went to Anglo families, primarily um, uh, graduate students at the colleges. Uh, Lou Crutcher, who uh, was a student of Whitney Smith, Whitney Smith, uh, did he taught here at uh, uh, in Claremont um, Architecture. Millard Sheets brought him in to teach, and uh, designed the houses. They're very simple. They're single wall plywood, um, four by four um, framing, and uh, very simple. And they um, they still exist. The community is still intact. And uh, we just uh, last year were able to get it listed on the National Register of Historic Places. But it's a, it was a wonderful project. Whitney Smith, uh, who many of you are familiar with, um, actually did a lot of things in Claremont. In fact, his very first project was, or is, right across the street from us, just on the southeast corner of 8th Street and Indian Hill. And it was a house for a physician, and, and so it included his office and had a house in the back, and it's, it's still there. Um, uh, we went out to uh, UC Santa Barbara and did some research in, in the Whitney Smith uh, archives and uh, found photographs of it, and it's it's amazing, amazing place. But that was his very first project. Whitney Smith also uh, helped put together uh, an exhibition called 16 Architects. It was at Scripps College in 1950. And this brought together um, architects from all over Southern California. Um, I mean, names that you would recognize, some that you might not. And uh, it was an exhibition here at Scripps College that one can only uh, think that this maybe helped influence some of the, uh, the architecture that came afterwards. But it was also interesting because they put together uh, kind of these displays with, that showed interior and exterior furnishings and finishes, and they had fabrics and all kinds of things, textiles. It was very interesting. And then the, um, the displays had the architecture with blueprints, and uh, actually some of the graduate students built the displays and put this together, and this was uh, just over here on the Scripps campus. Theodore Criley Jr. and uh, was one of the premier architects that uh, that worked here in Claremont. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he and uh, his uh, eventual partner Fred McDowell um, designed over a thousand built projects in and around Claremont. This was his own house, 1952. Um, it doesn't show it, but the back of this house is all glass. It almost looks like uh, Farnsworth or something. It's it's amazing. Uh, it's uh, it's still here. It has been um, altered a little bit. Uh, second story has been added, although uh, very complimentary and um, uh, just a nice example. It was interesting that that Crowley used much of uh, more traditional furnishings in his homes than uh, many of the uh, modern architects. He also did the Hilliard Residence, 1952, which is just behind the uh, Pomona First Federal Bank uh, up here. This is going to be on our home tour this year, and uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful example of a small, um, modern, modern home. Carl Benjamin House that I mentioned earlier, designed by Fred McDowell, uh, 1955. Here's a shot of it uh, right after it was built. Um, Claremont was not the city of trees then. <laughs> it was actually um, pretty much all orchards here. I mean, the, the uh, citrus industry was really what um, financed Claremont in the early days. And uh, so there was all citrus groves. In fact, this, uh, this park used to contain a number of citrus groves. 
uh, at one time, and uh, they were all around. And then we have the depot and uh, the packing houses just down on, along the tracks that would uh, ship uh, the, the product out to the East Coast and elsewhere. But this was a house, um, very simple, uh, post and beam construction, a um, little bit reminiscent of some of the things that uh, Palmer and Chrysler did in Palm Springs. Um, but this was the idiom of the day. It was, uh, it was a simple uh, post and beam construction with adding various elements that gave some interest. Foster Rose Jackson, who I'm really hoping that Alan Hess is going to talk about later, um, studied at, he was one of the, I think, the first fellows that came out of Taliesin West. I'm not positive about that. Alan probably knows. But he built just a huge complex up in the hills here. And um, this was his own home. He had his studio there. He actually uh, published a couple of books. He had a printing press up there. And he was, um, uh, and you can see the influence of Taliesin uh, in his work, but he is, he's one of the kind of unsung heroes of, of modern architecture here in Claremont. Also up in the Padua Hills, we have uh, a couple of Richard Neutra houses. The Hanch House, uh, 1955, sits way up on the top of Olive Hill and uh, um, Mrs. Hanch uh, still lives there, the original owner. Uh, I think she's nearing 100. Uh, Barbara Lamprecht and I went and visited her uh, a year or so ago, and um, uh, maybe Barbara will talk about some of the Neutra projects here, but this is one of those uh, just seminal Neutra projects that, uh, you know, were done all over the place, but we do have two here in Claremont. Uh, another Fred McDowell project, this is the McIntosh residence, uh, uh, Harry McIntosh, the ceramicist, um, his home and studio. Can you see the post and beam construction? Next door to that is the other Neutra residence, the Nineman House. It's now owned by uh, actually a, uh, um, a guy who came up from Argentina. Argentina, uh, Dominic Paglia, and to work specifically with Neutra, and uh, he did work with Neutra for uh, many years, and then eventually was able to buy this house when it came on the market. Uh, Domingo Paglia also was a landscape architect. He actually designed the landscaping at the Sheet Studio down on uh, Foothill. And he's also an artist. Does amazing work. Here is a uh, the Crane Residence, 1961, architect Fred McDowell. This was in a tract of homes that was called Faculty Row. A lot of the faculty at the colleges built homes there. They were primarily all done by either Fred McDowell or um, or Theodore Criley. Um, there is one Sheets home there, and. Uh, um, but it's uh, another tract. And as, as Claremont grew and these neighborhoods started to evolve, we see a lot of that. I and mean, we've seen that all over Los Angeles and Southern California. But these, you know, these uh, areas of um, modern, modernism and, and growth. And it wasn't that you know, it was necessarily um, uh, planned that way. But it was, it was uh, like I said, it was, the, it was the style of the day. It was the idiom of the day, the vocabulary. and uh, and we, we had some great architects. I'm going to leave it there um, for now. And uh, are there any questions? No questions? No. Yes, sir. Oh. No, no, no. No questions. Oh. <laughs> no questions. Sorry for that. Oh, we have. Um, I haven't seen any reminiscences of uh, the stone buildings of, of this area that were in the orange groves and the lemon groves where people lived using local stones to build with. Were any of these architects inspired by that and used that in their work? Uh, I would say 
at least for the modern architects that know that, that they don't think that they were, although that we do have a whole neighborhood of stone houses um, called Russian Village. It's actually on the National Register as well, just in kind of the southern part of uh, Claremont. And we do, we do have a, uh, a little booklet on it. But it was, that was, um, uh, I think it was more of a kind of a, a craft thing where people were just, built with uh, what they had at hand. And whereas I think the, uh, the modern architects, although they did use some stone, it wasn't the local stone that we find here. We call them Claremont potatoes um, because when you, you know, we're in a, at the bottom of an alluvial uh, wash. And so we've got all these, these stones that when, uh, when they do excavating that uh, come up, but uh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen a connection. Well, there's a, there is a Lindley Mixon studio. But it uses local stone, but it, it's used in a way that, um, like uh, Foster Road Jackson used in his own home at the Tali S and West, where um, concrete and stone were put together um, to create a structure. And uh, so, I mean, I guess as opposed to, yes, he did use uh, local stone, but uh, but it wasn't. Uh, um, I think that's just because it was here. It was, but in that same thing with Talius and West, I mean, they used the rocks that were, you know, part of the environment. I think the new modernism was not inspired by the roundness of those stones. They wanted square, more, you know, horizontal and vertical lines. And see, they use stones there, but they're flat. Yes. It's a completely different look. Thank you, Carolyn. Hi, um, I'm actually a landscape architect, and I was wondering if you could comment on how landscape architecture was regarded at this time. Well, uh, landscape architecture was actually um, pretty highly regarded, depending on uh, what you what you look at. At the colleges, they they use some uh, major major ar architectural uh, landscape architects to to design some of the the boulevards and things at the colleges. On the residential level, um, I know there was certainly influences uh, uh, Garrett Ekbo and some of the modernist. Uh, I, I don't know that any of them actually worked in Claremont, but um, some of the original landscapes that you see in photographs um, do. Uh, reflect some of those ideals and ideas. I think probably, um, well, actually I talked to Carl Benjamin about his, his, I mean, he basically planted his own yard and, and I think a lot of people did that in, in suburbia where they kind of, you know, using the sunset books, guides or whatever, or, you know, um, I mean, you really see that influence. So, um, yes. Um, I think one of the other things oh, that's right. Oh, that you see in uh, the, the landscape architecture of some of these homes was the philosophy of light to the street and the attention is really into the um, exterior, the backyard area. Mm -hmm. you know, they could make a statement, but that was one of the things was light to the street and the activities all located. So like when, when you look at Dominic Taglia's house today, the interior, the exterior, the front yard, the exterior beautiful landscape, but that's something he did. The focus, the swimming pool, the um, glass walls that face out to the backyard, those are all really common features that all of these homes. So the, the comment was um, that basically um, there, there are many good examples here in Claremont of the kind of the quintessential California indoor outdoor living lifestyle. And where there would be a uh, you know basically a blank wall to the front, and we saw that in many many of these images. Uh, Cliff May, um, you know, was famous for that, um, as many others. Um, where the the outdoors were really brought in from where the the, the and, and of course Neutra was, you know, I mean he was brilliant at this, really creating a uh, a view to the outdoors to really. Um, if not actually in reality, but visually bringing the indoors into the into the living environment. 
I just had a quick question about, well, congratulations on the Intercouncil Council Housing. And she's yeah, she's actually asking a question. So so as soon as she's done, we can pass the mic to you. Um, congratulations on the Intercultural Council Housing. That is fantastic because I think that's such a unique project. Um, David, do you happen to recall how large those dwellings are, and was it standard wood framing? Or they seem to look like almost like structural panels of some sort. It's it's basically it's based on a four by eight. Um, sheets of plywood basically okay. you know three quarter inch marine grade plywood and four by four uh um you know wood uh pieces of wood i mean it's really it's it's as about as simple as you can get and it's um you know a number of them have been updated and and insulation added and things like that but um they were really i mean we have such a wonderful climate here that you don't you know, I mean, you can live pretty comfortably without uh, without adding a, a lot of insulation and things. Um, yes. I only want to know if you have some reference about the furniture. About the the furniture. Well, the furniture. The houses, yeah. Uh, well, re reference in terms of who designed it, or yeah, who designed and the type of furniture that. Most of it was, uh, you know, the, what was kind of popular of the day, the modern, there were some, you know, modern uh, furniture stores, I don't think in Claremont, but certainly in Pasadena that uh, sold things. And of course, the magazines were all promoting, you know, the lifestyle and uh, shelter publications were promoting furniture by, you know, Charles and Ray Eames and, you know, Danish design. And there was, you know, there was a lot of, um, in fact, you see a lot of influences in this house, this uh, this is all uh, Danish uh, design furniture here, pretty much, and even the lighting, I think. Oh, there is, is there, oh yeah, yeah, you're right, there you go, right, the, the dining chairs in the table. I don't think they are, but really? I'm just saying, you're talking about furniture. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people, in, in, in fact, because when Sam started, I mean, he was, you know, he was working for basically the local community. And uh, um, artists and things would, you know, appreciated his work. I mean, it was it's it's functional sculpture, and he did work for Millard Sheets for a number of years. He did some, um, uh, he pulled some uh, lithographs and serographs with in Millard Studio, and I think I heard the story that Millard said, "Sam, you need to start making some furniture or something." I don't. I mean, he, he had done some things originally, I think, for just his own home, and, and Miller responded to that and, you know, so encouraged him. Yeah, no, and um, it's interesting because the, uh, the artists and the designers and the architects would, there was kind of groups of them that would get together, and Sam kind of led this, group that they would go and have lunch at uh, uh, Walter's uh, down in the village, which actually the, the main building was a Foster Rhodes Jackson design. And uh, about once a week, I think it was usually a payday and they'd go and have lunch and hang out. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I think we're out of time for questions, okay. uh, but a few announcements. First of all, we'd like to entice our speakers here by offering them lunch. Unfortunately, we can't get everybody lunch. <laughs> We're sorry about that, but uh, for the speakers, please follow David this is, and I. This is a few <laughs> That's true. Um, if you look at it that way, um, there's also a set of keys that were left in the bathroom. Um, if anybody recognizes, it's like a, um, a Chrysler, Subaru. 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 Um, are these yours? Yeah, it's awesome. Okay. <laughs> uh, is there any walking distance? Uh, David, do you have suggestions? Well, let's see. I, it depends on what you consider walking distance. Um, the closest restaurant is about six blocks away, and that would probably be Walters, which is just down in the village. If you know, if you want to drive down to the village, which is if you just go down Indian Hill and um, 
there's the west side and the east side, and there's just a bunch of little shops and restaurants. Um, you, you could find something. Um, if you want some recommendations, I'm happy to. Um, we're going to go to a Thai restaurant or a Asian fusion restaurant called 5050, just uh, down Indian Hill here. But there's great Italian. There's um, all kinds of. If you want, if you like good burgers, I can point you to a good burger place. And you know what? I'm going to have Sean. Do you want to run in and get some of the village maps? And we can. Um, then you can kind of look and see and pick out maybe your own. And we're also running about 15 minutes late. So we're going to extend lunch by 15 minutes. I'm hoping that maybe some of the speakers can help make up some of our time. Um, but uh, please return at uh, 1.05 uh, p.m. Um, and Alan Hess will start promptly at 1.05 and you don't want to miss his presentation.